Great Books for Children, read by Mrs. B. My Side of the Mountain by Jean Craighead George. In which I have a good look at winter and find spring in the snow. With Christmas over, the winter became serious. The snows deepened, the winds blew, the temperatures dropped until the air snapped and talked. Never had humanity seemed so far away as it did in those cold, still months of January, February, and March. I wandered the snowy crags, listening to the language of the birds by day and to the noises of the weather by night. The wind howled, the snow avalanched, and the air creaked. I slept, ate, played my reed whistle, and talked to Frightful. To be relaxed, warm, and part of the winter wilderness is an unforgettable experience. I was in excellent condition, not a cold, not a sniffle, not a moment of fatigue. I enjoyed the feeling that I could eat, sleep, and be warm, <clears throat> excuse me, and outwit the storms that blasted the mountain and the sub-zero temperatures that numbed them. It snowed on. I plunged through drifts and stamped paths until eventually it occurred to me that I had all the materials to make snowshoes for easier traveling. Here are the snowshoe notes. I made slats out of ash saplings, whittling them thin enough to bow. I soaked them in water to make them bend more easily, looped the two ends together, and wound them with hide. With my penknife, I made holes an inch apart all around the loop. I strung deer hide crisscross through the loops. I made a loop of hide to hold my toe and straps to tie the shoes on. When I first walked in these shoes, I tripped on my toes and fell. But by the end of the first day, I could walk from the tree to the gorge in half the time. I lived close to the weather. It is surprising how you watch it when you live in it. Not a cloud passed unnoticed. Not a wind blew untested. I knew the moods of the storms, where they came from, their shapes and colors. When the sun shone, I took Frightful to the meadow, and we slid down the mountain on my snapping, snapping turtle shell sled. She really didn't care much for this. When the winds changed and the air smelled like snow, I would stay in my tree because I had gotten lost in a blizzard one afternoon and had had to hole up in a rock ledge until I could see where I was going. That day, the winds were so strong I could not push against them, so I crawled under the ledge. For hours, I wondered if I would be able to dig out when the storm blew on. Fortunately, I only had to push through about a foot of snow. However, that taught me to stay home when the air said snow. Not that I was afraid of being caught far from home in a storm, for I could find food and shelter and make a fire anywhere. But I had become as attached to my hemlock house as a brooding bird to her nest. Caught out in the storms and weather, I had an urgent desire to return to my tree, even as the barren weasel returned to his den and the deer to their copse. We all had our little patch in the wilderness. We all fought to return there. I usually came home at night with the nut hatch that roosted in a nearby sapling. I knew I was late if I tapped the tree and he came out. Sometimes when the weather was icy and miserable, I would hear him high in the tree near the edge of the meadow, yanking and yanking and flicking his tail, and then I would see him wing to bed early. 
I considered him a pretty good barometer, and if he went to his tree early, I went to mine early too. When you don't have a newspaper or radio to give you weather bulletins, watch the birds and animals. They can tell when a storm is coming. I called the nuthatch barometer, and when he holed up, I hold up, lit my light, and sat by my fire whittling or learning new tunes on my reed whistle. I was now really into the teeth of winter and quite fascinated by its activity. There is no such thing as a still winter night. Not only are many animals running around in the creaking cold, but the trees cry out and limbs snap and fall and the wind gets caught in a ravine and screams until it dies. One noisy night, I put this down. There is somebody in my bedroom. I can hear small exchanges of greetings and little feet moving up the wall. By the time I get to my light, all is quiet. Next day, there was something in my room last night. A small tunnel leads out from my door into the snow. It is a marvelous tunnel, neatly packed, and it goes from a dried fern to a clump of moss. Then it turns and disappears. I would say mouse. That night, I kept an ember glowing and got a light fast before the visitor could get to the door. It was a mouse, a perfect little white-footed deer mouse with enormous black eyes and tidy white feet. Caught in the act of intruding, he decided not to retreat, but came toward me a few steps. I handed him a nut meat. He took it in his fragile paws, stuffed it in his cheek, flipped and went out his secret tunnel. No doubt the tunnel leads right over to my store tree, and this fellow is having a fat winter. There were no raccoons or skunks about in the snow, but the mice, the weasels, the mink, the foxes, the shrews, the cottontail rabbits were all busier than Coney Island in July. Their tracks were all over the mountain, and their activities ranged from catching each other to hauling various materials back to their dens and burrows for more insulation. By day, the birds were a wing. They got up late after I did and would call to each other before hunting. I would stir up my fire and think about how much food it must take to keep one little bird alive in that fierce cold. They must eat and eat and eat, I thought. Once, however, I came upon a male cardinal sitting in a hawthorn bush. It was a miserable day, gray, damp, and somewhere around the zero mark. The cardinal wasn't doing anything at all, just sitting on a twig, all fluffed up to keep himself warm. Now there's a wise bird, I said to myself. He is conserving energy. None of this flying around looking for food and wasting effort. As I watched him, he shifted his feet twice, standing on one and pulling the other up into his warm feathers. I had often wondered why birds' feet didn't freeze, and there was my answer. He even sat down on both of them and let his warm feathers cover them like socks. January 8. I took Frightful out today. We went over to the meadow to catch a rabbit for her. As we passed one of the hemlocks near the edge of the grove, she pulled her feathers to her body and looked alarmed. I tried to find out what had frightened her, but saw nothing. On the way back, we passed the same tree, and I noticed an owl pellet cast in the snow. I looked up. There were lots of limbs and darkness, but I could not see the owl. I walked around the tree. Frightful stared at one spot until I thought her head would swivel off. I looked and there it was, looking like a broken limb. 
a great horned owl. I must say I was excited to have such a neighbor. I hit the tree with a stick and he flew off. Those great wings, they must have been about five feet across, beat the wind, but there was no sound. The owl steered down the mountain through the tree limbs and somewhere not far away, he vanished in the needles and limbs. It is really very special to have a horned owl. I guess I feel this way because he is such a wilderness bird. He needs lots of forest and big trees. And so his presence means that the Gribbly farm is a beautiful place indeed. <clears throat> One week, the weather gave, gave a little to the sun and snow melted, and limbs dumped their loads and popped up into the air. I thought I'd try to make an igloo. I was cutting big blocks of snow and putting them in a circle. Frightful was dozing with the sun and with her face in the sun, and the tree sparrows were raiding the hemlock cones. I worked and hummed and did not notice the gray sheet of cloud that was sneaking up the mountain from the northwest. It covered the sun suddenly. I realized the air was damp enough to ring. I could stay as warm as a bug if I didn't get wet. So I looked at the drab mess in the sky, whistled for frightful, and started back to the tree. We holed up just as Barometer was yanking his way home and it was none too soon. It drizzled, it misted, it sprinkled, and finally it froze. The deer hide door grew stiff with ice as darkness came, and it rattled like a piece of tin when the wind hit it. I made a fire, the tree room warmed, and I puttered around with a concoction I call possum sop. A meal of frozen possum stewed with lichens, snakeweed, and lousewort. It is a different sort of dish. Of course, what I really like about it are the names of all the plants with the name possum. I fooled for an hour or so brewing the dish, adding this and that, when I heard the mouse in his tunnel. I realized he was making an awful fuss and decided it was because he was trying to gnaw through ice to get in. I decided to help him. Frightful was on her post, and I wanted to see the mouse's face. When he found he was in a den with a falcon, I pushed the deerskin door. It wouldn't budge. I kicked it. It gave a little, cracking like china, and I realized that I was going to be iced in if I didn't keep that door open. I finally got it open. There must have been an inch and a half of ice on it. The mouse, needless to say, was gone. I ate my supper and reminded myself to awaken and open the door off and on during the night. I put more wood on the fire as it was damp in spite of the flames and went to bed in my underwear and suit. I awoke twice and kicked open the door. Then I fell into a sound sleep that lasted hours beyond my usual rising time. I overslept, I discovered, because I was in a block of ice and none of the morning sounds of the forest penetrated my glass house to awaken me. The first thing I did was try to open the door. I chipped and kicked and managed to get my head out to see what had happened. I was sealed in. Now I have seen ice storms and I know they can be shiny and glassy and treacherous, but this was something else. There were sheets of ice binding the aspens to earth and cementing the tops of the hemlocks in arches. It was inches thick. Frightful winged out of the door and flew to a limb where she tried to perch. She slipped, dropped to the ground, and skidded on her wings and under coverts to a low spot where she finally stopped. 
She tried to get to her feet, slipped, lost her balance, and spread her wings. She finally flapped into the air and hovered there until she could locate a decent perch. She found one close against the bowl of the hemlock. It was ice free. I laughed at her and then I came out and took a step. I landed with an explosion on my seat. The jolt splintered the ice and sent glass covered limbs clattering to the earth like a shop full of shattering crystal. As I sat there, and I didn't dare to move because I might get hurt, I heard an enormous explosion. It was followed by splintering and clattering and smashing. A maple at the edge of the meadow had literally blown up. I feared now for my trees. The ice was too heavy to bear. While down, I chipped the deer flap clean and sort of swam back into my tree, listening to trees exploding all over the mountain. It was a fearful and dreadful sound. I lit a fire, ate smoked fish and dried apples, and went out again. I must say I toyed with the idea of making ice skates. However, I saw the iron wagon axle iced against the tree and crawled to it. I de-iced it with the butt of my axe and used it for a cane. I would stab it into the ground an inch along. I fell a couple of times, but not as hard as that first time. Frightful saw me start off through the woods, for I had to see this winter display, and she winged to my shoulder, glad for a good perch. At the meadow, I looked, hopefully, for the sun, but it didn't have a chance. The, sea, sorry, the sky was as thick as Indiana bean soup. Out in the open, I watched one tree after another splinter and break under the ice, and the glass sparks that shot into the air, and the thunder that the ice made as it shattered or something to remember. At noon, not a drip had fallen. The ice was as tight as it had been at dawn. I heard no nuthatches. The chickadees called once but were silent again. There was an explosion near my spring. A hemlock had gone. Frightful and I crept back to the tree. I decided that if my house was going to shatter, I would just as soon be in it be in it. Inside I threw sticks to Frightful and she caught them in her talons. This is a game we play when we are tense and bored. Night came and the ice still lay in sheets. We slept to the occasional boom of breaking trees, although the explosions were not as frequent. Apparently the most rotted and oldest trees had collapsed first. The rest were more resilient, and unless a wind came up, I figured the damage was over. At midnight, a wind came up. It awakened me for the screech of the ice limbs rubbing each other, and the snapping of the ice were like the sounds from a madhouse. I listened, decided there was nothing I could do, buried my head under the deer hide and went back to sleep. Around six or seven, I heard Barometer, the nuthatch. He yanked as he went food hunting through the hemlock grove. I jumped up and looked out. The sun had come through and the forest sparkled and shone in cruel splendor. That day, I heard the drip drip begin and by evening, some of the trees had dumped their loads and were slowly lifting themselves to their feet, so to speak. The aspens and birch trees, however, were still bent like Indian bows. Three days later, the forest arose, the ice melted, and for about a day or so, we had warm, glorious weather. The mountain was a mess. Broken trees, fallen limbs were everywhere. I felt badly about the ruins until I thought that this had been happening to the mountain for thousands of years, and the trees were still there, as were the animals and birds. 
The birds were starved and many had died. I found their cold little bodies under bushes and one stiff chickadee in a cavity. Its foot was drawn into its feathers. Its feathers were fluffed. Frightful ate old frozen muskrat during those days. We couldn't kick up a rabbit or even a mouse. They were in the snow under the ice, waiting it out. I suppose the mice went right on tunneling to the grasses and the mosses and had no trouble staying alive. But I did wonder how the barren weasel was doing. I needn't have. Here are some notes about him. I should not have wondered about the barren weasel. He appeared after the ice storm, looking sleek and pleased with himself. I think he dined royally on the many dying animals and birds. In any event, he was full of pep and ran up the hemlock to chase Frightful off her perch. That barren. It's a good thing I don't have to tie Frightful much anymore, or he would certainly try to kill her. He still attacks me more for the fun of being sent sprawling out into the snow than for food for he hasn't put his teeth in my trousers for months. January was a fierce month. After the ice storm came more snow. The mountain top was never free of it. The gorge was blocked. Only on the warmest days could I hear deep under the snow the trickle of water seeping over the falls. I still had food, but it was getting low. All the fresh frozen venison was gone and most of the bulbs and tubers. I longed for just a simple dandelion green. Toward the end of January, I began to feel tired and my elbows and knees were a little stiff. This worried me. I figured it was due to some vitamin I wasn't getting, but I couldn't remember which vitamin it was or even where I would find it if I could remember it. One morning, my nose bled. It frightened me a bit. I want, and I wondered if I shouldn't hike to the library and reread the material on vitamins. It didn't last long, however, and I figured it wasn't too serious. I decided I would live until the greens came to the land, for I was of the opinion that since I had had nothing green for months, that was probably the trouble. On that same day, Frightful caught a rabbit in the meadow. As I cleaned it, the liver suddenly looked so tempting that I could hardly wait to prepare it. For the next week, I craved liver and ate all I could get. The tiredness ended the bones stopped aching and I had no more nosebleeds. Hunger is a funny thing. It has a kind of intelligence all its own. I ate liver almost every day until the first plants emerged and I never had any more trouble. I have looked up vitamins since. I am not surprised to find that liver is rich in vitamin C. So are citrus fruits and green vegetables the foods I lacked. Wild plants like sorrel and dock are rich in this vitamin. Even if I had known this at that time, it would have done me no good, for they were but roots in the earth. As it turned out, liver was the only available source of vitamin C, and on liver I stuffed without knowing why. So much for my health. I wonder now why I didn't have more trouble than I did except that my mother worked in a children's hospital during the war, helping to prepare food, and she was conscious of what made up a balanced meal. We heard a lot about it as kids, so I was not unaware that my winter diet was off balance. After that experience, I noticed things in the forest that I hadn't paid attention to before. A squirrel had stripped the bark off a sapling at the foot of the meadow, leaving it gleaming white. I pondered when I saw it, wondering, wondering if he had lacked a vitamin or two and had sought them in the bark. I must admit I tried a little of the bark myself, but decided that even if it was loaded with vitamins, I preferred liver. 
I also noticed that the birds would sit in the sun when it favored our mountain with its light, and I, being awfully vitamin-minded at the time, wondered if they were gathering vitamin D. To be on the safe side in view of this, I sat in the sun too when it was out. So did Frightful. My notes piled up during these months, and my journals of birch bark became a storage problem. I finally took it out of my tree and cached it under a rock ledge nearby. The mice made nests in it, but it held up even when it got wet. That's one thing about using the products of the forest. They are usually weatherproof. This is important when the weather is as near to you as your skin and as much a part of your life as eating. I was now writing more about the animals and less about myself, which proves I was feeling pretty safe. Here is an interesting entry. February 6. The deer have pressed in all around me. They are hungry. Apparently they stamp out yards in the valleys where they feed during the dawn and dusk, but many of them climb back to the hemlock grove to hide and sleep for the day. They manage the deep snows so effortlessly on those slender hooves. If I were to know that a million years from today my children's children's children were to live as I am living in these mountainsides, I should marry me a wife with slender feet and begin immediately to breed a race with hooves that the Catskill children of the future might run through the snows and meadows and marshes as easily as the deer. I got to worrying about the deer and for many days I climbed trees and cut down tender limbs for them. At first only two came, then five, and soon I had a ring of large-eyed, white-tailed deer waiting at my tree at twilight for me to come out and chop off limbs. I was astonished to see this herd grow and wondered what signals they used to inform each other of my services. Did they smell fatter, look more contented? Somehow they were able to tell their friends that there was a free lunch on my side of the mountain and more and more arrived. One evening there were so many deer that I decided to chop limbs on the other side of the mountain. They were cutting up the snow and tearing up the ground around my tree with their pawing. Three nights later they all disappeared. Not one deer came for limbs. I looked down the valley and in the dim light I could see the open earth on the land below. The deer could forage again. Spring was coming to the land. My heart beat faster. I think I was trembling. The valley also blurred. The only thing that can do that is tears, so I guess I was crying. That night the great horned owls boomed out across the land. My notes read, February 10, I think the great horned owls have eggs. The mountain is white, the wind blows, the snow is hard packed, but spring is beginning in their hollow maple. I will climb it tomorrow. February 12th. Yes, 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 yes. It is spring in the maple. Two great horned owl eggs lie in the cold snow-rimmed cavity in the broken top of the tree. They were warm to my touch. Eggs in the snow. Now isn't that wonderful? I didn't stay long for it is bitter weather and I wanted the female to return immediately. I climbed down, and as I ran off toward my tree, I saw her drift on those muffled wings of the owl through the limbs and branches as she went back to her work. I crawled through the tunnel of ice that leads to my tree now, the wind beating at my back. I spent the evening whittling and thinking about the owl high in the forest with the first new life of the spring. And so with the disappearance of the deer, the hoot of the owl, the cold land began to create 
new life. Spring is terribly exciting when you are living right in it. I was hungry for green vegetables, and that night as I went off to sleep, I thought of the poke weeds, the dandelions, the spring beauties that would soon be pressing up from the earth.